Now, our next speaker before we break for morning tea will give us a little more food for thought. That is Dr. Lisa Williams, lecturer in the School of Psychology, the Faculty of Science here at the university. She is a social psychologist and her research explores how emotions shape and are shaped by social processes. In particular, Lisa focuses on positive social emotions such as pride and gratitude and I was sort of feeling both of those things just a minute ago listening to that music and, and to our speakers this morning. Lisa is a member of the steering committee for the University of New South Wales Women in Research Network, which helps female academics conducting research here to connect and form positive professional relationships. This morning, we're privileged that Lisa will talk to us about the benefits of a diverse workplace. Please welcome Dr. Lisa Williams. All right, good morning, and uh, thank you, Kim, for that introduction, uh, and thank you to today's organizers for putting together such a truly fantastic event. Um, I'm a social psychologist by training, as Kim mentioned. Uh, I study the interplay between emotions and social interactions, and how emotions actually come to shape our behavior in adaptive ways. I'm not a marine biologist, so you might wonder why I have an image of a coral reef here. Um, there are many other fantastic scientists in this room who might tell us why ecosystem diversity is so important for the adaptation and the maintenance of an ecosystem. What I want to propose today, without getting into the biology of that, is that we need to maybe consider the discipline of science as an ecosystem. And to make that ecosystem work, we need diversity. Diversity not only in gender, but across all social groups. Today I will be focusing on diversity and, uh, in essence, in equity. Now, the truth of the matter, as has been pointed out already today, is that we actually don't have very much diversity in terms of gender. This infographic comes from Foundation L'Oreal, uh, who commissioned research into the channels of women in science. Now, according to data from the US, Germany, Japan, China, France, and Spain, as well as the UK, a gender difference actually emerges at the university level. As we progress, we see, to the doctoral stage, we see a 75-25 split. And from there, the picture becomes even more dire. Now, we might take issue with whether the Nobel Prize is the capstone of a career in science, but I think it's a telling statistic that since its inception in the early 1900s, only 3% of Nobel laureates are women. Now, many refer to this as the leaky pipeline. And a lot of the formal discussions around women in science are how to plug the metaphorical leaks. Um, I, what I'm going to discuss with you today are some of the psychological factors at play that have led us to this situation. And hopefully our understanding of some of these psychological factors can begin a progressive discussion about how to rectify this. Now one of the easiest faults to identify when we're asking this question of why, why is this the case? To go back to Angela Moll's question, let's ask, like, act like four-year-olds here. Why are we looking at statistics like this? Well, one of the easiest things to pinpoint is explicit bias against women pursuing careers. Now this idea is poignantly captured in this children's book spread. While on the left, boys invent things, on the right, Girls use what boys invent. Now, this book is from the 1970s, and as it turns out, uh, it was likely drawn and illustrated in satire. Now, unfortunately, the case is that this message does resonate. It resonated then, and it still resonates today. It wasn't even two months ago that two female scientists, including one from Australia, were advised by an anonymous reviewer that, quote, it would probably also be beneficial to find one or two male biologists to work with in rejecting that manuscript for publication. Now, what was that manuscript on? Gender bias in academia. <laughs> Sad, but true. Um, it took until 2014 and a woman designer to create the all-female research institute Lego set, which was wildly popular but only released as a limited edition and sold out quite quickly. It turns out um, that 
Lego now includes many female characters due to the demand around this unique set in many of its STEM-related sets. While this is excellent, it should also give us pause that this is only happening now. We hear many fly-on-the-wall stories about gender-based com comments on science-related ability from high schoolers as well as up the research chain. It appears that there are some who are not at all shy to explicitly discourage women from a career in science. In this room today, we find such stories cringeworthy, and that's a good thing, but they are a matter of truth. And what I want to spend more time talking about are the types of bias that are more subtle. In many ways, subtle biases are more pernicious. That is, they bubble away behind the scenes. And understanding how these more subtle biases work might be the first step of a discussion about how to address them. One subtle instantiation of bias is stereotype threat. Now, as a social psychologist, I've studied stereotype threat a bit myself. For the purpose of explaining this, I'm going to use the example of the stereotype that women have lower math abilities than men. Now, by no means am I saying that this is a true stereotype, yet it is a stereotype. Let's imagine a male and female colleague um, discussing some modeling of their scientific data. According to stereotype threat, the woman in this conversation may be aware of the gender math stereotype, and she may become concerned about confirming it. The process can kick in even if she doesn't believe this stereotype, and even if she knows herself to be high in math's ability. Now, social psychologists would describe her as being, quote, under a stereotype threat. The fallout of this can be quite negative. Her concern about the potential of confirming this stereotype may distract her or make her anxious during this discussion, thus making her less eloquent and, ironically, confirming the stereotype. A variety of studies have brought this process into the lab for closer examination. In one example, women who were made aware of the gender math stereotype were performing worse on a test that was slated as assessing math's ability. Men did not show a similar effect. Something as simple as indicating your gender on a test form before taking that test can actually lead to gender differential performance. So activation of stereotypes about women's abilities can be particularly bad. And in support of the background, what's going on in the minds of individuals who are under stereotype threat, a variety of studies have identified that it's a reduced working memory capacity. It's actually physiological anxiety that is bubbling away in the backgrounds of individuals under stereotype threat. And it's these background, me <laughs> these background mechanisms that are actually interfering with performance. So we can see how, here how explicit stereotypes that abrasively circulate around society can actually come to influence our everyday interactions, not due to either party in that interaction actually holding the stereotype, but instead simply being aware that they exist. Now I'd like to point out another way that bias can crop up. And this one is particularly relevant to today's conversation, as it affects women in science, women in leadership, and perhaps doubly so, women in science leadership. The foundation of this process lays in two fundamental dimensions of social perception. That is, how we come to perceive others. And as it turns out, these two dimensions capture fundamentally different ways of interpersonal approach. One of these is captured by the term interpersonal warmth. Warmth reflects friendliness, trustworthiness, and nurturance. The other dimension, which today I'll call agency, captures intelligence, ability, and assertiveness. It turns out that these two dimensions, warmth and agency, are at the heart of many gender stereotypes. To put it bluntly, women are perceived to be higher in warmth than agency, and men are perceived to be higher in agency than warmth. Women even perceive themselves, on average, to be higher in warmth and less, <laughs> lower in agency than men. And men hold the same converse self-stereotypes. On their own, these stereotypes are not necessarily bad. However, we also know that certain careers and professions are also subject to warmth and agency stereotypes. 
Of most relevance to today's discussion, science and leadership are stereotypically high in agency and low in warmth. As the logic goes, to do well in science, one needs to be agentic. And perhaps it is warmth traits that may come to interfere success in this domain. You may begin to see how this is building to a picture of bias. Women, given that they're stereotypically warm but not agentic, may be perceived as less suited to careers that are stereotypically high in agency and low in warmth, such as science. For me, the real kicker in understanding the nature of warmth and, warmth and agency stereotypes is the apparent trade-off that we must make when we are pursuing careers. If we take it to be the case that women pursuing careers in science is counter-stereotypic, the research suggests that these such counter-stereotypic pursuits are subject to the trade-off, such that women who are pursuing careers that are stereotypically high in agency suffer a penalty in how they are perceived in warmth. And the same is true for men who may choose to pursue a career that is stereotypically high in warmth. When, um, I'd like to point out here that the onus of this effect is not simply on perceivers, that we ourselves, when we are pursuing careers, actually engage in differential behaviors that may give rise to these perceptions. When asked to be agentic, it turns out individuals of both genders end up acting less warm. And when asked to be warm, we actually act less agentic. So going back to a discussion of women in science leadership, there is an apparent trade-off to be navigated. The gender stereotypic pressures to be warm may make it difficult to pursue positions that supposedly require agency. And if for, Winston, if, for instance, a woman pursues these positions, she may suffer a kickback against how warm she is perceived to be. Can't you have both, you might ask? Why can't you be both warm and agentic? Well, the data suggest that in our society, with the prevailing pressures around gender stereotypic norms and career stereotypic norms, that that's not really possible. This trade-off is firmly ensconced. The final subtle source of bias I'd like to discuss is the subtlest of them all. This is frequently termed unconscious bias. The core of this is that all of us hold conceptual associations in our mind, concepts that might be particularly relevant right now in the lead up to morning tea between coffee and biscuits, between sunshine and warmth. Now, some of these concepts are more strongly associated with each other than others, and many of the concepts we have are actually related to the social stereotypes I've been discussing so far. So when we go about making a decision, perhaps about what career we ourselves pursue or what advice we might give a prospective scientist, we rely on the degree of conceptual associations in our mind to inform whether that decision seems like a good fit. Now, on the one hand, we have concepts about gender. And I've mentioned a lot of the content about the stereotypes about gender. And on the other hand, if we consider concepts about professions, we've set up a pretty stark contrast. Social psychologists have developed really um, sophisticated ways to get at these conceptual associations. And to make a rather long scientific story short, it turns out that both men and women have stronger conceptualizations between men and science than they do women in science. And so what this means when we are considering career paths, it may seem more right at a very basic, non-conscious, automatic, uh, categorical level to see a man pursuing a career in science. By their nature, these conceptualizations operate outside of conscious awareness. And so at first glance, it may seem that these would be particularly hard to, tra to tackle. But what I will say is that there is a ray of hope here. It turns out as society shifts, so do the nature of non-conscious biases. There is recent data that current shifts around um, biases against non-heterosexuals over the past 10 years have become less biased. And so here today I hold up as a bit of hope as we shape our conversations about women in science that so too will change our non-conscious bias against women in this profession. I'd now like to shift gears for a moment to speak of the benefits of diversity in academic workplace, which of course is the title of this talk. 
Uh, I'm going to make two points here that loosely boil down to why should the university care about pursuing gender diversity, or in this case, equity, but also why we should care, we as practitioners of science. But I'd like to note before I give this data that both of these are interwoven because a happier workplace is also a more productive workplace. So why should universities seek gender equity? Well, tackling the stereotypes that I've just described, Tackling the stereotypes that I've just described is daunting, and it's not cheap or easy, but it turns out that organizations that do this best actually have a more productive workforce. Here are data compiled from nearly 300 organizations, and gender equity scores within the organizations were collated and used to model employee productivity. Along the x-axis here, we have Blau's index, which ranges from zero, meaning all male, to 0.5, which is equal representation of gender. And on the y-axis here, we have employee productivity. The shift in producti productivity here is striking. So as organizations become more equitable, so too are the employees more productive. Turning the context here to universities, it's not hard to imagine the translation that equal gender representation might produce more UNSW publications. It might actually secure more external funding, all of which is great for the university bottom line. All of that is well and good, but frankly, I would want to see an argument that equity er, is also uh, beneficial at a personal level. And luckily, we have evidence of that as well. So here I'm going to present data from a sample of academics in a North American university. And the goal here was to predict how satisfied these academics were with their job and how much emotional well-being they had. Now, the, research measure, the researchers measured a variety of potential predictors, including the degree of respect each academic felt within their department, their sense of isolation from colleagues, how much decisions at the university appeared to be biased, the efficacy of the university's harassment policy. But the two key variables I'd like to highlight today are the degree of support for work-life integration, that is balancing the demands of family versus the demands of one's career, and the perceived climate for women at that university. So when each of these variables on the left were used to predict job satisfaction and an emotional helps, health separately for men and women, you can see here that support for work-life integration and climate for women were of the most important predictors, such that women academics who felt that their university supported work-life integration and had a positive climate for women were actually more satisfied with their jobs, and they also felt higher degrees of emotional health. Now, what's noteworthy here um, in the data for men is that these factors are important, but the story really for men carries with work-life integration. So these examples provide some context and impetus for pursuing gender equity. We know that there will be a long uphill battle in changing some of these social stereotypes. Uh, we need to tackle not only explicit stereotypes, but also the activity of much more subtle stereotypes, as I've discussed. And I wish to make a final point here, and this stems from my orientation as a social psychologist recognizing the importance of social interactions for well-being and for society. And what I wish to point out here is that in a lot of ways we are made up of our social networks. So our well-being comes from our connections to other people. And in careers in science, this can boil down to conversations about mentoring, and it can boil down to conversations about social networks. And what I'd like to point out that as practitioners of science, we have networks both up the chain, mentors, and down the chain. We serve as mentors, but we also serve as friends and colleagues. As we saw in the data at the beginning, uh, it cannot be the case that women can only network with other women because of the relatively low representation of them. Now, there are great uh, systems in place at this university, including the Women in Research Network that Kim mentioned, of which I am part of the steering committee. But we need to open this discussion more broadly and discuss how our social networks can actually progress careers, especially for women in science. So I'd like to finish with a point um, that unlike actually Euclid's proof that Catherine Greenhill mentioned, gender inequity in science is not a truth and it's not immutable. 
It is something that is subject to change. And maybe by understanding some of the subtle processes at play here, we can begin in discussion to tackle this. And maybe the new truth will become a much more gender equitable place. Thank you very much.